everyone, and uh, welcome to the 345 Mainframe Theater session. Uh, this is a security panel on mainframe security. Is it a disaster waiting to happen? So I'm going to uh, invite Jeff Charrington to come up on stage. He's the panel moderator, and he's going to invite some of the other panelists up. Thank you. Thank you very much. My name is Jeff Charrington. I am the product area manager for mainframe security, or as my boss affectionately refers to me, I'm a Pam. But I am delighted here today to be joined by the esteemed panel that will be joining us, Steve Garrett, who is with Wells Fargo, Julianne Williams, who is with Millennia, and Steve Hosey with Cybersecurity. Please help me welcome them for this discussion. So we, we've already posed a provocative question in the title of this panel. Is complacency around mainframe security a disaster waiting to happen? That's got to be a question asked and answered, isn't it? But with that said, we have some other questions that perhaps talk more to the risks that we're all facing, that cyber attacks in the way that they are orchestrated are giving rise to more and more damaging impacts on enterprises, on public institutions, and in the integrity and the confidence that the public has in what we're able to provide. As we think about the role the mainframe plays today as that most responsible, most reliable, most securable member of the servers in the data center, we also understand that it's increased interconnectivity with the distributed side of the technology introduces new risks, even as it gives us new economies. So please listen to the insights of our experts as we talk to how we can better protect our mainframe. And please prepare questions as there is time at the end of the session, we'll invite you forward. If you do have a question, please come forward to the microphone so that everyone can hear. So, as we introduce our panelists, we have um, talked about multiple mainframe breaches. As I was uh, talking earlier in a session, we explored the Logica brief, uh, breach that ended up in uh, a severe uh, financial impact for one of the, uh, the Swedish banks, Nordea. And in that particular situation, we do see that while the mainframe is the most securable platform, there are opportunities where it needs additional security to actually be effective. So as we think about this, these, these breaches, we, we hear that the mainframe cannot be breached. How do we respond to that sort of question, Steve? Would you be? Sure. Uh, we've heard that statement before. Nobody's breaking into mainframes. I started breaking into mainframes about 25 years ago. I've broken into several. It's not that difficult if the mainframe is not configured properly. Uh, it's only as secure as you make it. We're a bit of a victim of our own success. Uh, we have protected mainframes very, very well over the years, and it's built up a reputation as something you don't need to worry about. Wrong. <laughs> Julianne, do you have reflections from your experience? I do, I think partly it's because the mainframe's been around for such a long time, because we've had 50 years of this technology to play with. And when you look at the start of the technology 50 years ago, it wasn't being breached. It wasn't being breached because the internet didn't exist. Hackers at that time were people that were doing things with telephones. They were messing around getting free calls. Uh, and we were completely outside of that. The uh, networking technologies that we were using were completely proprietary and we weren't open to the world. Now, we're connected to the internet and you have to rethink. The fact that there's been such a huge amount of complacency around it, I think is probably based in that it's old technology. And I keep hearing this word legacy. Do you know that we're the only industry that uses legacy as a negative term? Any other industry, anywhere else, you leave a legacy, you're doing something positive for mankind. So I think that's probably where some of these problems stem from. And, and Mr. Hosey, Steve Hosey, yourself, what, what are your thoughts on this particular topic? I think there's a lot of complacency um, out there that's actually led to at least one mainframe in recent history 
in Northern Europe haven't been breached. And that was due to a lack of proper controls uh, haven't been applied on that mainframe and the mainframe security. So when we hear about mainframes not being breached, it is possible, as Steve Garrett led to, uh, it really depends upon are the controls documented, are they implemented, and um, are they tested? And for the most part, they should be, and then we wouldn't see mainframes that are being breached. And that's certainly what we have seen with this particular egregious hack with Nordea. And one of the thoughts that I've shared with the audiences throughout the day is we do have at least two, three, perhaps more documented technical breaches of the mainframe. And what we realize is that of those that are documented, there are more that are not. If there are not disclosure uh, regulations that require it, you know that there are going to be other events that we will not see in the press, but are affecting those of us in the industry who are responsible for protecting the mainframe. So if we, if we move forward from the perspective of compliance, should the mainframe be considered out of scope? And Julianne, I'll start with you this time, if I might. Well, we did the rehearsal for this section. We debated <laughs> the idea of just sitting here and all three of us going, hell no. <laughs> <laughs> no, it is not out of scope, this machine holds a significant proportion of your vital data. You've got to consider it the same as any other platform. There's a, a phrase that's being used across the universities that I help to teach in, teach mainframe subjects in uh, across Europe, and it's just another platform. As far as security is concerned, the mainframe is just another platform. And while the Pirate Bay hacks exploited Unix system services uh, openings, they weren't limited to the Unix system services environment. We have got to take this seriously. We have got to start behaving responsibly towards uh, our businesses. And Steve Garrett, you're, you're the man standing at the coalface. I mean, you're the one who, who actually deals with this at a practical level every day. So when you talk to your auditors, how far out of scope do they push the main brand? <laughs> uh, I push it right back in scope. <laughs> I put the crosshairs on it. Uh, we've all heard the statistics. The majority of the data is coming from the mainframe. That's where all the systems are getting it from. Uh, Unix system services, yes, that's a vulnerability. Why? Because we haven't been paying attention. It's an integral part of the mainframe today. We have facilities within the mainframe security products to address it. Do it. <laughs> it needs to be done. One of the things that, that I know um, some of the folks here have been talking to our folks about really bears on that because it is now a mainframe that has pervasive TCP IP connectivity. It does have Unix system services and clearly now it has support for Java and that's introducing new risks that I don't know legacy controls really are uh, configured to address. And so, Steve Hosey, I wonder if maybe you would expand a little bit on the types of controls that you think are particularly appropriate to help us protect against those kinds of risks. Well, as far as the mainframe security controls go, um, both the CA's products, CA, CF2, and Top Secret, provide a unique uh, ability to secure the OMVS side of the house with HFS SEC. Uh, that provides you both with the auditing tool, violation reports, all in one product, all in one place, as well as auditability and security. You don't have to expect your uh, mainframe ZOS staff to go and learn OMVS permissions, and it provides a lot more granular control over that area than uh, perhaps that other product at the, that's out there to secure mainframes. It's certainly true, and as we look at the, the question at the bottom of the slide, in other words, should CIOs and CISOs be worried about the mainframes? Clearly they should, and it is the onus on us to impress upon them that while sound controls were put in place for the mainframe in prior periods, those controls must now be expanded to protect us against the new risks that the new mainframe is bringing forward. Those standard controls also need to be reviewed for appropriateness today in the 21st century because what we were securing against is not the same thing that we are securing against now. We used to be trying to secure against people doing accidental damage to data. So we had 
read access set up for everything. Now read access lets you take a copy and sell it to the highest bidder. Got to rethink. So Steve Hosey, if I can, I can lean on you again. What do you see as the greatest threat to security of the mainframe in the future? Well, there's all sorts of threat levels. Um, things that come to mind is, again, um, security controls, are they documented? Are they implemented? Are they validated? And do they ensure least privileged access? Meaning that you only get the access that you truly need for the function and purpose you're performing in that role, and no more. Um, as Julianne said, there's so much of the past history is, oh, everybody needs read access. No, that's not true. Another area that is a great threat is we have auditors who come into our organizations, and they can't even spell mainframe. <laughs> they have no audit experience, perhaps a degree in anthropology, <laughs> and yet they're foisted to start doing an audit checklist against a mainframe based upon a mid-tier server checklist. I can remember not so long ago, I was asked by an auditor, fresh out of college, can you provide me with a list of your passwords? <laughs> we need to verify that your passwords are meeting your standards. I'm like, what do I answer to that? <laughs> Politely, of course. <laughs> um, certainly, we have lots of threats to, to the mainframe and security. A lot of it has to do with our management. They're not mainframers. They don't understand what we have. We have to do a better job at selling our knowledge, our platform to them, and also what the risks are involved if you're not implementing least privileged access controls. And Julianne, as, as you work with the, the market, what are you seeing as the greatest emerging threat that our audience should be thinking about as they prepare to protect their assets? I honestly think one of the biggest problems that we've got at the moment is all of the legislation that we're dealing with. Because we get an audit done and we're proven to be compliant with Sarbanes-Oxley or we're proven to be compliant with PCI DSS. And that means that the management sit back and go, yeah, we're doing a great job. But those things are for specific financial reasons. They're not looking at the same things that a hacker is looking at. They're not looking at the things that you need to think about. We need to start thinking a lot darker about this stuff. We need to start looking at it in the same way that the NSA looks at it. Assume you've already been breached. The Nordea hack, uh, the Logica problems, they weren't noticed for six months. And they were noticed not by security, but by the performance management group because an, app, a, 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 an active persistent threat application was left running and that was using MIPS. And it was noticed because of the excess use of MIPS. We need to be thinking more broadly and we need to be thinking more dark. One of the things that we've certainly spoken to here in the session, and, and Steve, I'll go just a tiny bit off topic, is how the organization of attacks has expanded and the number of resources that are being thrown against the, the barriers and the protections that are in place have increased. Not so much within the financial vertical, but very clearly we have evidence to believe that it was a nation state attack against one of the large healthcare providers. Uh, something that we can only guess or fear may be part of a larger strategy that a foreign power is applying against our most valuable and most protected assets. You're responsible for protecting one of the largest financial institutions in the world. How does that enter into your thinking as you're preparing? We would absolutely be a target if someone wants to disrupt society in order to make a point. What better way than to hit an institution such as that? Uh, that definitely does put a different perspective on things. Uh, as has been said, in many cases in the old days, it was the main purpose of your security system was to keep you from shooting yourself in the foot. These days, uh, they're shooting with uh, automated weapons with laser sights. Automated weapons with laser sights and with such sophistication that they attack from all sides, the social engineering attacks, the technical attacks, the uh, 
subversion of the rogue insider attacks, it, it really does present a very daunting problem. So as we look forward here, many of the mainframe professionals are retiring or being replaced by millennials with the proliferation of web-based applications and accessing mainframe data. Apathy caused by belief that the mainframe is inherently secure. I know you've got a passion around this particular topic, Steve, and I would ask you to, to share your thoughts and feelings here. I like to say the problem is apathy, but nobody cares. <laughs> uh, we, we, as I said before, we are a victim of our own success. We've been very successful at securing the mainframes. We've got excellent tools to secure the mainframes. But if you don't pay attention to it, if you don't do the required homework, it's a false front. We have this facade of being secure, and that works against us. We need to spend the time the resources, the efforts to keep up with the evolving technology. The mainframe is not a static platform. It's gone forward in leaps and bounds. It's amazing what the mainframes of today can do. The, ex the number of ways that you can connect to a mainframe are always increasing. A lot of the systems today that we consider to be non-mainframe are getting their data from the mainframe. How do they do that? They have an avenue of access that has to be protected. Julianne, anything to add? Yeah, I think partly we, we need to, again, I, I sound like a doom monger, we need to be looking more at the open system interfaces because a lot of what's gone on recently, we've been forced to implement very insecure connections to those open systems interfaces because they just need to work, damn it. And it's not enough. Good security shouldn't be obvious to any of your users unless they're trying to do something wrong. And that's where we need to get to, where the belief in us comes back again. The belief has gone away because for the last 30 years, we've been told the mainframe's going away. I started in this industry 30 years ago, and on my very first day, I was told I was wasting my time because in five years' time, there would be no more mainframes in the world. Just not true. We're creating new boundaries and creating new worlds constantly. Indeed. And do you have anything to add, Steve? No, you know, really, the last sentence comes to home a lot. Some, some other combination of the above. Um, having audited many other organizations and looked at from one LPAR, one mainframe LPAR to 30, there's many organizations that are out there still that don't have a good set of document, documented standards to go off of for implementation of security controls to secure the mainframe platform. That presents a lot of challenges from how does the team know what they're implementing correctly to the management team, how do they know that their teams are, doing, are securing the mainframe to the auditors who want to know what controls do you have implemented for your mainframes to secure your data in your operating system. That's a serious concern. And if you don't have those basic controls, certainly there are some, some controls that a lot of people have talked about, the STIGs, or Security Technical Implementation Guides, that are written by the De Department of Defense. And they're available out there for a, a baseline, if you want, um, to look at and to compare what you do have. And maybe if you're missing, you can adopt something else. After today, you can go over to the Security Center and they'll, they'll have a reference sheet on a PDF they'll give out to you uh, that'll tell you where you can get the STIGs and download those, those basic controls if you don't have such. It's a great place to start with because all these, these issues are very important, but if you don't have a baseline set of controls that are documented, published, verifiable, and tested, have you really secured your mainframe? And is your data secured? And in my case, is my data secured? Because it could be on your mainframe. Indeed. So consider the following statement. The persons responsible for mainframe database security don't have a lot to worry about. And if you were worried about the attacks, you can disable FTP to thwart malicious code uploads or firewall off the mainframe with web access or from web, web access, as seems common. How many are really 
firewalling their mainframes off <laughs> and no hands raised. Beyond that, mo beyond that, most of the flaws mu must be addressed by IBM through code changes. This was uh, published in a blog in 2013 by Adrian Lane of Securosis. So, Julianne, I'll start with you. <laughs> <laughs> I, I was speaking at a, a UK conference a couple of weeks ago, and uh, in the UK you're allowed to swear a lot more than you are here. <laughs> so, <laughs> so I'm trying to be really careful about what I say. Um, I've been trying to think of a polite way of putting this, but this Adrian Lane is an ass. <laughs> it's just, it's, it's not helpful. It doesn't reflect reality. It's, it doesn't reflect anything that, that any of us are seeing or any of you guys are seeing out there. Mainframe database security people don't have a lot to worry about. Really? Is that why we work such long hours? Is that why it takes so long to prepare for audits? Is that why we spend so much of our time justifying to our management what we do with our lives? Is that why we have real-time alerting sent to our cell phones when something happens? I just, I, I have no idea who this guy is or why anyone would ever listen to him. It, it, it was entertaining when we first introduced this question to the panel and got their unvarnished reaction. <laughs> But Steve, please take, share your thoughts. This statement is, so, is, is, is as ridiculous as the most more cu current statement that someone in OPM okay. coined out there that the famous OPM hack that has impacted millions of people through the federal government was caused by COBOL. Maybe that's the <laughs> IBM code they're talking that needs to be changed. It wasn't a mainframe hack, by the way. It was on a mid-tier platform. But it was COBOL that China stole all the identity from all these millions of federal workers. Utterly ridiculous. <laughs> and Mr. Garrett, this is just too rich an opportunity. I, I it, must it, ask it, for your thoughts as well. It is. It, it's worse than ridiculous. It's destructive. Yes. Because the uninformed are going to believe what this person is saying. And it is just total nonsense. Uh, I do believe that the title of this session is very true. We've become complacent about the mainframe. If we don't pay attention, we're going to be the next victim. And, just and add, I'm actually, oh, sorry, just to add very briefly to that, the last sentence I'm good with. There are vulnerabilities in ZOS that must be changed by IBM or other vendor Mm -hmm. software changes. That's absolutely the case. Do not think that you're not vulnerable because you're on a mainframe. It's just another platform. It's just another operating system. And there are zero day vulnerabilities in our code as much as there is in any other code. But the overall result of that statement is just damaging. I saw you raise your hand. Did you have I, I was just going to add, absolutely, it's destructive. In fact, it's irresponsible, just the same as when someone in OPM wants to coin it was COBOL that caused the hack. It, that's utterly irresponsible because that's promoting the deception and the myth that all everything is hackable. Well, mainframes, generally speaking, are the most securable platform available to secure and place your data on there as long as you have all the controls properly and fully implemented. We're seeing some strange responses to things in Northern Europe at the moment. The, uh, hack, the, the uh, Pirate Bay hacks have caused a turnaround. Um, organizations are starting to recover more quickly from a major hack event if they are public about their statements, if they tell the truth. Mm -hmm. If an organization is seen to be taking the hackers to court and people are being sent to jail, then that organization recovers their reputation more quickly than another one. And I can only hope that that starts to happen over here too. And I, I actually will step forward here and, and just add one comment. Adrian Lane is a personal friend. I've known Adrian for years. He actually is a relatively competent security professional. Then he shouldn't put stuff out like this. And I'm going to call <laughs> him on this very, very much. So I, I think he may have fall, fallen victim to what many do who make their living in part by blogging and has a deadline and throws something provocative out there without understanding the potentially destructive influence he could have. It, it really is an, an egregiously 
wrong-headed statement from, from every regard. So in summary, before we ask questions, a few words to review. Talk to your organizations. Don't let complacency, don't let reliance on the legacy, the controls that we grew up with, be the controls that are in place as you go forward into a new, more risky future that we're all going to experience. The mainframe is interconnected. It will remain interconnected. It will remain the critical transaction processing backbone of the enterprise. It will still be critically important as we advance into the application economy where we project there will be as many as 40 trillion transactions per day, monetary transactions from phones, from tablets, probably from devices we don't even contemplate yet. And the mainframe will still be the most securable, the most reliable online real-time transaction processing platform that it is our obligations as professionals to defend. And as I heard Steve Hosey say so eloquently, it is only the most securable platform and only as secure as you make it through the imposition of your appropriate controls and your anticipation of the very dark future that we could be facing as we, as we do the things we need to do to help our enterprises and to help our organizations. We have just a few minutes left. Uh, I certainly invite you to come forward and pose questions to these professionals and uh, hear their, their thoughts and opinions. Please, would somebody step forward? Um. So I heard, I, I'm sorry I didn't catch your name. The, Julian. Julian. So I like what you said about it being just another platform. And I've had some uh, debates with people at IBM about mainframe, specifically around vulnerability disclosures. And I'm curious to get the panel's uh, opinion, um, and yours too, if, if you like, on, on the idea of, of public disclosures of security vulnerabilities. The industry you know, Google, Apple, Microsoft have come a long way from like, you know, suing people for finding vulnerabilities in their platforms to paying them for finding vulnerabilities in their platform. And there's a lot, there's arguments to be made, you know, either way, but really the way that the industry seems to be going is like, you know, the, the more things we find, the better. We might as well encourage it versus just keeping it on the black market, which we know is out there. So the mainframe and, and specifically in IBM, we know aren't there. And I'm curious to see what you guys think about that. I'd really like to see IBM change their position on that. I mean, it's, uh, it's going to take a, a, a massive sea change in opinion to, to do that because they deliberately have been trying to implement security through obscurity for, for decades. But as the cases, as the, the Pirate Bay cases went to court, if you go and Google the court information from Pirate Bay, you can reconstruct everything that they did through the hack. You can see that it was a Unix person that did the hack because the first thing they did when they got into Unix system services was look for the password file. You can see exactly the process through there. And the more cases go to court, the more open IBM are going to have to be. Otherwise, they're going to just start to look ridiculous uh, and, and outdated. I think it's going to have to happen. They're going to have to follow the model that everybody else does. But for now, just keep an eye on it and register your interest for security APARs because otherwise you won't see them. I would also say it's not just IBM. Oh, yeah. uh, <laughs> I've seen many instances of vendor products that have been brought in that unless you properly vet them, you won't know that you're bringing in a major security headache. I've seen products that are used internationally that granted everybody on that platform read access to all data. I've seen products that were brought in that the first thing they did was they owned your security database and yet they were only responsible for a small function. Those things exist, you have to pay attention to them. 40 seconds, any closing thoughts, Steve? Um, yeah, I, I think that it's time to look at a regulatory regulation that's across not just the United States, but looks across to other countries and see if we can get regulatory requirements out there that if there's zero day exposures, the companies with those have a certain period of time to fix, patch, and provide that support to their customers or they're financially obligated and liable for any loss of data and or losses that the, the companies that are using their products incur. 
I, I think it's far t past that time. You go from suing people that find the exposures to now you're paying them. Well, that's wonderful. I think it's time that we have a regulatory uh, regulations there, no less than Sarbanes-Oxley, or maybe part of an updated one, where it's required that the vendors that provide the operating systems, the the software, that they become financially liable if they are if they know, and they choose not to patch within a reasonable specific period of time. Steve, Julianne, Steve, thank you very much for your time and for sharing your insights. Please, thank you very much, and thank you very much for your time and your attention. Have a good day, and enjoy the rest of CA World.